What can you tell us about uh, what's been found off the coast of India? Well, what's been what's been found off the off the coast of India? You have two separate sites. Um, you have sites in the northwest of India, and you have sites as about as far away from those as you can get and still be in India, in the southeast of India. And I've been following both of these areas as a as a diver and as a researcher for for several years now. So one of India's government agencies, the National Institute of Ocean Technology, which specializes in high tech instrumentation for remote surveys on the seabed, was conducting a survey in a place called the Gulf of Cambay in northwest India. Now, uh, they were not doing archaeology. They're, they were there actually testing the pollution levels in the Gulf of Cambay. Mm -hmm. And they were using an instrument called side scan sonar, which sends out a beam down to the seabed and which uh, bounces back uh, a, a, an image yeah. what's on the seabed. What I feel is that the basic proposition that I put forward, that, which is that there was a higher level of civilization, perhaps much higher uh, than we've expected way back in the Ice Age, and that uh, an urban city, city-dwelling culture, a culture that had reached that level, uh, was destroyed by the rising sea levels at the end of the Ice Age and that we're going to find the remains of it underwater. That seems to be, that seems to be being supported by, by evidence at the moment, but we need to do a whole lot more work on these places and there's a lot of bridges to cross yet, but it's looking good. So back in May last year, um, they were doing this survey and they started to notice very regular geometry, geometrical formations on the seabed. They, they, had geologists with them and they just couldn't understand what these things were. They were about 120 feet down and they were very extensive and they focused their survey in that area, followed this up, and they found that what they seemed to be sitting on top of were two cities, uh, roughly five miles long and about a mile wide, laid out alongside of ancient riverbeds, parallel to each other but about 15 miles apart. And uh, to give a, a sense of the size of these cities, if you added them both together, you would have a city the size of Manhattan. Oh my God! Now, what, this is this this is very extraordinary, and it was a very extraordinary discovery at the time because the depth of submergence suggests that these are very old. But when the National Institute of Ocean Technology went public with its findings in May last year, nobody took them seriously because uh, the suggestion that they could have been fantastic cities of this scale thousands and thousands of years ago, which had been covered up by water, was just too difficult for archaeologists to swallow. And they suffered a lot of ridicule at that mm -hmm. time. But they didn't give up. And they went back with their research vessel. And they pulled up using, uh, in fact, a mechanical grab. They pulled up. They put themselves over the top of the cities. And they pulled up from the seabed more than 2,000 man-made artifacts, uh, including pottery, Jewelry, even human remains, teeth, bones, uh, a vertebrae, a jawbone, um, w wonderful things. Wow! Well, how, 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 how would those? Uh, how would human remains last that long? I can understand some other artifacts, but human remains—that's amazing. In fossilized form, yeah, they do. And these were and these were were fossilized, and they had uh, they had lasted because they ran carbon dating tests uh, on pieces of cut wood that were found amongst this artifact. The wood, wood was perfectly preserved. Right. And uh, the date that they got from the carbon dating, which is a standard archaeological tool, and I'm often accused of ignoring it, um, but a date that was given by carbon dating was 9,500 years ago. <coughs> 7,500 B.C. That's about 4,000 years older uh, than any city known to archaeologists anywhere in the world. Uh, and it suddenly led to a, to a huge jump in the seriousness with which these um, ruins on the bottom of the Gulf of Cambay were taken because no longer could it be said that they were simply an artifact of the imaging process or some kind of scientific hallucination. Mm -hmm. Once you pull 2,000 artifacts out of them, it, it, it obviously and logically enormously increases the possibility that they're man-made. And in fact, nobody in India is in serious doubt about that now. The, the clearest signature of what kind of people they were comes from the character of the buildings that they've left behind, which are now on the seabed. And these are very extensive uh, structures with, with huge walls and massive foundations. There's another technique called sub-bottom profiling, 
which will do, it kind of takes an x-ray of the sea bottom and looks at what's underneath the bottom. And what sub-bottom profiling has shown on these structures in the Gulf of Cambay is that they have massive foundations, very, very strong, and probably made of very large blocks of stone. Huh. Uh, the character of the walls that are left above water is just huge. It's on, a, it's on an enormous scale and very geometrical with lots of right angles in it, and you can see, see clear shapes of, of, of large, square, and rectangular constructions. Now, for a society to put all of this together, 9,000 or more years ago, um, we, we, you have to understand that at that period of the past, what archaeology says we're dealing with is just small villages and settlements. Yes. The very largest that you might find, uh, well-known places like Jericho and uh, Kapil Hayek in Turkey, which are both known early settlements, uh, are about 150 times smaller than what we find on the bottom of the Gulf of Cambay. <laughs> so it's, it's completely, it's completely out of context and perspective in the, in the period to which it's applied. Now, even beyond that, you have to, when you look at a big city, you have to ask yourself, how did those people support themselves? How did they eat? How did they sustain themselves? Exactly. And it's difficult to imagine uh, a city or cities of these sizes um, being established without a solid agricultural base to feed them. However. 9,000 years ago, agriculture is supposed to have been only just beginning, just beginning, hmm. uh, not have got to the stage where it could support large cities. Far from that, thousands of years away from that. So there we have another mystery. And I think, I think it's possible that the answers to all of these mysteries are, are on the, the 10 million square miles of land that was submerged by rising sea levels around the world at the end of the ice age. That's an area bigger than South America and North America as far as the Canadian border added together. Right. You've been doing an Indiana Jones thing all over the world, it seems like, something in the Bay of Bengal. What are you doing there? This is southeast India. We were talking uh, a few moments ago about uh, big cities that have been discovered underwater in northwest India. Oh, that's right, yes. But uh, right far away in the southeast of India, uh, off, off, an, uh, off an, a state of India called Tamil Nadu, inhabited by Tamil-speaking people, um, there has been another uh, discovery. And in fact, this discovery was made by Indian archaeologists uh, some years ago, back in 1993, mm -hmm. they were doing a, a survey of ruins uh, which were very close to shore in that area. In fact, they were so close to shore that some of them were exposed, completely exposed at low tide. And these ruins were dated accurately to not very old, between 300 B.C. and 300 A.D. Mm -hmm. But while they were doing that survey, they also decided to look in deeper water and they went out, uh, again, using initially side scan sonar, but in this case supported by diving and, uh, as well, including by myself. Uh, they went out uh, with side scan sonar, and they, they found at five kilometers from the shore, say three miles out from shore, right. at a depth of 70 feet, uh, a very large structure which shouldn't be there. Uh, they couldn't figure out what it was. It was shaped like a horseshoe, and it was shown on the side scan sonar to be surrounded by other structures. Um, in 93, they put down some marine archaeologists to dive on it, and they found that it was a man-made structure uh, with courses of uh, blocks clearly visible in the side of it under the marine growth. But they didn't know what to do with it because it was so far from shore it didn't appear, couldn't be connected to the ruins that were inshore and much younger. I like to think, uh, from studying ancient texts, and in this case particularly relevant are the ancient texts of uh, India, that we may be looking at a, at a society which in some ways was very different from ours. If they developed technology, it would have been of a, of a different sort. The primary interest of that society was not particularly technological or material. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even see this in India today, that, that uh, millions of people in India spend their entire lives just wandering as pilgrims from place to place, having completely renounced the world because they believe that uh, attachment to the world slows down the progress of the soul. Um, so we can't assume that an earlier society, an earlier civilization was as interested in technology as we are. For archaeologists who are, who are invested <coughs> in the present view of the past, which yes. is which is a straight-line uh, development from rather 
simple and primitive beginnings through a nice series of gradual evolutionary steps until we get cities and eventually end up with what with what we have uh, with what we have today. That that such uh, that such an idea uh, simply cannot accommodate cities that are 9,000 years old at the bottom of the Gulf of Cambay. And in fact, I have to stress that the date on those cities, which is retreat from carbon dated artifacts, is supported by sea level studies because there's a whole science which studies the extent to which sea level rose at the end of the last ice age. Mm-hmm. And this science puts the submergence of the Gulf of Cambay around about 7,700 years ago. So, uh, it, it means that the cities there couldn't have been built before that date, and so the carbon date of about 1,500 years older than that makes sense. What's intriguing about this structure in, in southeast India is the depth of submergence on that coast. It could have been uh, a civilization that was based on certain beliefs, yes. based, based on certain facts that we yes. no longer understand, correct? I, I think that's, that's, exactly the way, that's exactly the way to look at it, that it, it raises two questions. Not only the possibility that, that great civilizations can be destroyed and lost for thousands of years, uh, almost without trace, but also that the pattern in which a civilization evolves is not necessarily fixed in the model that we have today. Perhaps there are other ways for this to happen. Perhaps our kind of global dominant society today is only only one of many routes that human beings could take and then perhaps not even necessarily the best. Now, you saw this with your own eyes. Is there any question at all about what you saw? No. As far as as I'm concerned, I've, I've seen a lot more evidence on this than has so far been made public. And by the way, this story... The story of the Indian underwater cities has ha- is hardly known about at all in the U.S. I wanted to say uh, something about uh, earthquakes in two of the areas that uh, Graham described mm-hmm. uh, in India. Yep. Uh, in October, there was a 0.6 uh, earthquake in the ocean, uh, 50 kilometers from Pondicherry. Yeah, that's uh, in the east, uh, on the east coast of India, yeah. Yeah, southeast. Yeah. And um, it... Uh, uh, I, I happened to be around 150 kilometers uh, from uh, there at the time, so I can tell you for sure there was an earthquake. Yep. And um, the Indian newspaper said that because of this Pondicherry quake, the scientists would have to redraw the earthquake zone map of India because mm. previously they had not considered this to be an earth, uh, a high-risk area. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, an earthquake, now you say this was 200 kilometers offshore? Oh, no, uh, the uh, 50 kilometers uh, in the, uh, from Pondicherry towards the ocean. In other words, in the ocean, 50 kilometers from Pondicherry. I get you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is unusual. Earthquakes in that area are unusual. It's a stable, uh, it's a stable part of the continent. Up in, up in northern India, a different matter, of course. Uh, in northwest India, very bad uh, earthquakes as a result of mountain building processes there. But in, in southeast India, no, it's supposed to be stable. So that is interesting. Yes, uh, the one in the north, of course, was famous, uh, being devastating, the one in Gujarat. That's right. That, that, was, that was one of the worst uh, earthquakes that has occurred for, for a very long time, and it had catastrophic effects in, in, in Gujarat, which can still be seen uh, to this day because I was out there relatively, relatively recently. But that's an area where you expect earthquakes yeah. and well, where they're regular. But in southeast India, they're not. Yeah, well, since with this new information, uh, I guess they can be expected now there also. It would seem that uh, two of these civilizations that are underwater uh, Mm. may actually be in earthquake zones. So I thought that might be interesting. It's a very very interesting point and one worth developing because the scientists who are studying the end of the Ice Age have found a very curious link between uh, periods of rapid meltdown of the ice and periods of increased earthquake and volcanic activity around the world.